Hi, I'm Meta Spencer, and today we're going to talk to some friends who are all into the business of uh, governing us, uh, or at least uh, have thought a lot about the business of governing us. Uh, we have Charles Burton, who is uh, a, an expert on China and has somebody I call on quite frequently when I want somebody who's an expert on China, because I don't know very many others. Um, and here's Peter Russell as well. Peter is in Toronto. He's a retired professor of political science, who's probably the leading expert on Canada's constitution. And in Philadelphia, we have James Ranney, who uh, has already started making a pitch for the uh, desirability of using arbitration rather than international law and world federalism as a solution to world uh, you know, war. And here in Toronto, we have Doug Saunders, uh, who is a regular on this show. He likes to do this kind of thing and he shows up every chance he gets. So I'm always glad to have him because he is provocative. And I don't know where you are, Mary Lou, but uh, you say you're in your basement someplace. <laughs> <laughs> so wherever, are you in uh, Ottawa or Winnipeg? No, oh, I'm, I'm in the West and I'm at our family cottage, very isolated. Oh, are you in Manitoba? Mm hmm. Okay, very good. Good to see you. Mary Lou McFedrin is a Canadian senator. Very good. Okay, guys, we already started almost a, a dispute here when uh, <laughs> I, I asked uh, Jim Rennie to talk, begin to, uh, uh, what I think is a controversial uh, position, uh, which is that he thinks that uh, instead of using world federalism as a solution to our global problem of conflict, we should submit everything to arbitration. So uh, uh, folks, you're all familiar with each other's arguments a little bit, and you're very welcome to intervene and mix it up. And, and fortunately you're all separated so it can't get violent uh, otherwise. <laughs> Jim will <laughs> okay, know how to Jim. fix it anyway. Jim, you want to recap what you were about to say? And I know that Peter is just itching to argue oh, with you. Yes. <laughs> Well, basically, the book argues for alternative dispute resolution mechanisms, starting from the premise that we need to abolish war, or war will abolish us, as it's been famously said. And that leads directly to the premise that we need alternatives uh, to war, which is alternative dispute resolution. And it's not just arbitration. Uh, arbitration is the third of four stages of international dispute resolution processes that are dealt with in considerable detail, starting with what's frequently forgotten. In fact, it's uniformly forgotten by international legal scholars, internet, uh, compulsory negotiation, which two historians believe would have prevented World War I. And then the second stage is compulsory mediation, which would probably solve about 90% of all the conflicts in the world. And those not solved by Compulsory mediation would move on to the third stage of compulsory arbitration, which was very popular in the late 1800s and early 1900s. Even the Republican president, William Howard Taft, was a proponent of that, as along with Theodore Roosevelt. But the uh, U.S. Senate, the Republicans in the U.S. Senate rejected it. And then finally, uh, somewhat contrary to what Meta was saying, the fourth stage is international adjudication. So it's, it's international law is not totally slighted, although she's correct in one sense. There are many instances in the book in which I say that existing international law is not what I'm talking about. It's rather these alternatives to uh, uh, resort to law. And, and so um, that's the crux of the proposal. I talk about the need to abolish nuclear weapons as a necessary, probably a necessary prelude to resort to international dispute resolution. And I talk about a backup to the final stage in the form of a UN peace force, uh, upsetting certain people who are pacifists. But I have a chapter 10 that deals at length with some of the, there have been considerable objections by some very mainstream thinkers to that proposal, but that's the basic crux of it. Okay, now, Peter, I will unleash you to attack this man, which I, I, I could just see it about to happen a little while ago. Well, first, Jim, I'm really interested in 
the title of your book. I want to order up a copy. Can you? I, I didn't write it down. Can you give us the oh, title? It's a, the, title it the title is something that I ended up having an arm wrestling match with my publisher. Originally, it was going to be called uh, Securing Lasting Peace. And I was concerned about the title World Peace Through Law since it implied that it was just existing international law or maybe even world federalism, which would be world law set up by a, a, a world parliament and, a, um, and so on. I do have a new book. Oh! Uh, which I uh, wrote, colon, The Biography of a Claim. It's a biography of the claim of sovereignty of 600 AD. I hope the militant atheists will be, forgive me for saying AD. Uh, <laughs> you, you understand what I mean. Uh, and the history of the claim, which only began then, uh, up to uh, up today. And it's only 149 pages. So it isn't very big. And uh, unlike uh, uh, you, James, uh, uh, because as you rightly say, compulsory is so important for mediation and arbitration internationally, I don't see how you get the compulsion um, without a world authority um, with independent armed force and the power to tax and raise forces. It has to uh, be like a, like a world federation in that there has to be, as in any federation, a central government with the independent power, independent of the sovereign states of the world. Otherwise, I don't see you can compel people into the various steps that lead up to arbitration. Yes. That is indeed the crux of the challenge to my proposals, is that what's going to make it compulsory? Well, nothing's going to make it compulsory except a growing, strong international norm. More important than a treaty uh, uh, is a, a growing international norm that would create this expectation that you would resort only to international dis alternative dispute resolution procedures before starting a war. There's a great quote from Alex de Tocqueville in which he says that basically you can have the most perfect constitution and the most perfect laws, but if you do not have the norms to back them up, you're in deep trouble. And contrary wise, you can have the poorest constitution and poorest laws, but if you do have those norms, then everything will go uh, very smoothly. But isn't so, that, uh, uh, pardon me, but that's really kind of begging the question, isn't it? Because I, I think everybody would agree that if, if everybody in the world would, uh, would agree to any kind of procedures for solving disputes, we wouldn't have the problems that we have. The problem is they don't. And right. what do you do with, a, I mean, here's Charles Burton, who knows all too well what happens when you have a, a country that, that governs its people. So they don't even know about uh, how are they going to build a norm in China, for example? Um, you know, certainly in terms of the People's Republic of China, the, the regime is hostile to the idea of the UN and the WTO as being, you know, at the top of determination of things. The, the Chinese Party General Secretary Xi Jinping wants to see what he defines as the community of the common destiny of mankind, which doesn't really accept the notion of equal sovereignty of states. And you see, you know, for example, um, when the Philippines uh, complained about uh, China um, establishing uh, through land reclamation military bases on reefs and rocky up outcroppings near the coast of the Philippines that 
you know, had been regarded as international waters and which were traditional fishing grounds for the Philippines and also very close to the Philippines. In other words, you don't want the, you know, military bases of a, of a foreign power to be very close to your sovereign territory. Um, anyway, China did a lot of land reclamation and put in these airstrips and ports and so on to establish a militarization of these international waters. So the Philippines, um, you know, sought a resolution under the UN Convention of the Law of the Sea by, um, by taking it to the uh, Court of Arbitration in The Hague, which, you know, is supposed to be the international body that adjudicates disputes under the UN Convention of the Law of the Sea. And, you know, the, this court did a wonderful job, really, and very fair, and produced a over 400-page decision determining that, you know, China shouldn't be putting those military bases on those reefs and rocky outcroppings, and, and the, the, those are international waters. Um, China then regarded the decision as a worthless piece of waste paper and said that they wouldn't uh, be paying any attention to it and have continued to, to militarize that part, you know, that critical uh, shipping um, zone. And, uh, you know, it's leading to potential for conflict because China wants to assert uh, rights over the airspace on top of it and countries including Canada, but particularly the United States and Japan and Australia have been running freedom of navigation exercises through the area that China says is Chinese sovereign territory. But, you know, I think in terms of the larger issue, uh, what you're dealing with is, is um, you know, two incompatibility incompatible interpretations of the history of one piece of territory. And, you know, I, I would judge that the most likely area for global conflict coming up is over Taiwan. You know, China has been sending a lot of military armed airplanes over around and, you know, beside the Island of Taiwan and, uh, and um, engaging in other activities designed to um, prepare for a, a transfer of power from the democratically elected um, uh, presidency of Tsai Ing-wen, a, a woman whose you know, policies are very similar to our own feminist, environmentalist, supportive of the rights of indigenous peoples, um, supporting the, the middle class and so on, um, uh, you know, that, that has been legitimately elected through a free and fair process of universal suffrage by the people of Taiwan, China thinks that that's an illegitimate regime and therefore it should be ruled from Beijing under the authoritarian norms, uh, autocratic norms of the Chinese Communist Party. Well, how do you resolve an issue like that? Uh, China, it, it's deeply felt. Um, you know, ordinary people in the mainland get uh, highly emotional and angry if you suggest that that perhaps the people of Taiwan believe that Taiwan is not a part of China as defined by the People's Republic of China and that, and that they would like to have their own um, independent country with, you know, a seat on the UN and, uh, and um, participation in international organizations of the sovereign state. So, so, you know, the, the resolution of this is almost impossible. And as China is a member of the P5 and, and an important nation who's able to um, exert economic coercion over nations like Canada, um, you know, we're, we're not seeing any kind of, uh, of uh, resolution on behalf of the people of Taiwan. In fact, as you've probably noticed, um, when the um, Halifax uh, uh, conference suggested that, that um, the Halifax Forum would um, designate the John McCain Award to the president of Taiwan, um, Canada then said that under those circumstances, we'd have to withdraw our funding for the Halifax uh, conference uh, because, well, they didn't say why, but one knows pretty clearly because China would be very unhappy if Canada was funding an organization that that legitimized the the um, the virtue of the Taiwan president. So, you know, so I, I, I love the idea and, and uh, you know, world peace through world law, I... I, I you know, I was a member of the World Federalist myself under the influence of Lois Wilson when I was a younger man. But uh, in terms of the practicality of it, 
I, I'm just not I'm just not seeing how this could be implemented. I would like to ask all four of the you guests, all of whom have um, I think a different and subtle approaches to this this question. Um, it's 50 years now since the UN de-recognized Taiwan and uh, and recognized the People's Republic of of China. Um, and we're seeing the United States nudging a little bit closer to the possibility of using recognition of Taiwan uh, as a sovereign state, as a, as a tactic. So my question would be, is it time to do that? Uh, if the Americans do it, should we, the rest of the democracies, join them? Um, is there a way to do this without provoking a military conflict? And what's the best way to do it multilaterally, assuming that a multilateral approach to recognizing Taiwan is the way to do it? I'm gonna claim a little bit of airtime here, if I may. Please. Uh, um, I think that it is something that we need to be looking at very seriously um, in parliament. And I think that the ways, the many ways, including during the COVID pandemic, that Taiwan has demonstrated its capacity, its independence, its reliability, its viability, all of those indicators we should be taking very seriously. And when we consider the fact that the aggression that, or I guess the aggressive posturing to which Charles referred earlier, some of that happened in the very early days of the Biden administration. And that response from the Biden administration, I think should inform, at least inform consideration by the Canadian government. I mean, there was a very clear statement of support, including acknowledging that there, there may be um, uh, weapons involved in supporting Taiwan's claim. And uh, the more that we as Canadians can support a democracy, a struggling democracy, in the face of the, the largest economic um, actor, and quite possibly, I mean, I don't think we know the extent of the militarization of China. But it's not only a very important symbol, I think it really calls into question Canada's capacity to put action with words when it comes to supporting democracy. Whoa, you're a tough lady. <laughs> <laughs> Who wants to uh, join this question? Let me just uh, add a brief note. Um, I have skin in the game, as it were, because we have in-laws who reside in Taiwan. My son married a young lady who uh, was born in Taiwan. And we have grandchildren who are half Taiwanese and half American. And so anytime I hear talk of what next about Taiwan, I am very personally concerned. I.e., for instance, are they gonna take a trip to see uh, some a relative, their relatives in Taiwan this summer as they have in the past summers or not, because you know there's going to be some kind of a conflict. Mm. And I don't have any, this, this world peace through law formula pretends to be sort of like some kind of a magic formula, but there's nothing magic about any of it. It requires very hard work over considerable time periods to create what I call these international norms. Are we there yet? Of course not. Excuse me, but I'm, I'm trying to c compare what Charles said with what Mary Lou said, because I think Mary Lou sounds, uh, resolute and and Charles sounded like a scholar uh, and I, I don't know whether you have advice to give or uh, you know uh, encouragement to give to one side or another Charles but to what extent do you go along with Mary Lou's um, what I thought sounded like readiness to issue a call to arms <laughs> well, it surprised I me <laughs> I mean, you know, it's clear that the the um, the DPP, the Democratic Progressive Party regime under Tsai Ing-wen, is in effective control of the island of Taiwan, and that that is a legitimate government because 
you know, I was on the international election monitoring team to 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 see if if there was any uh, you know um, ballot box stuffing or anything in that election, and uh, you know, clearly Taiwan's come a long way, and we couldn't detect any uh, irregularities um, at all in that election. So, you know, it, it was a fairly fought election, and the government is legitimate. So. When Canada established diplomatic relations uh, with China um, in the negotiations in the late 60s leading up to establishment of relations in October 1970, um, in the joint statement, Canada simply noted that we took, simply put down that we took note of the PRC's claim over Taiwan. We don't actually have a position as to, you know, the status of Taiwan, whether at that time when Chiang Kai-shek was there that that you know that 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 government the Kuomintang government was actually the legitimate government of all of China even though the population of Taiwan is 160th 1/60 of that of the mainland or um or that it should be a you know an independent uh, republic we we don't have a position on this and so really our policy towards China uh, Taiwan has been to try and um appease uh, the larger party, the mainland, in the context of our anticipating that China would become a, a responsible stakeholder in global affairs. And that, you know, we felt, um, you know, having been a student in China uh, before opening and reform in the revolutionary period, um, when I was at university there over all those years, um, after Mao, we expected that that China would gradually come into compliance with, you know, the international norms of governance and global affairs, and that we'd see a gradual democratization of China and, you know, multi-party elections for the leaders and and uh, um, independence of the judiciary and and so on. And I, you know, when I was a diplomat in China, I was responsible for our our, well, CETA put almost 1 billion Canadian dollars into good governance, democratic development, and human rights programming. Uh, anticipating John, that we could John, do can I ask you a question? I'm sorry. You were part of it, Peter. What's the position of the opposition in Taiwan? I know they, they respect the electoral process, even though they lost and fair and free election, but on sovereignty, are they uh, willing to... Uh, support um, a declaration by the Taiwan government of Taiwanese sovereignty or not? And, and would that matter in your mind? You're talking about the, the, the KMT, the, the nationalist regime. The yeah. KMT. They I have, have of course, previously their idea was to gloriously retake the mainland and that, that's gone down. Then they, then they had the 92 consensus which was one China, two interpretations, which is what the mainland yes. wanted Taiwan to adopt. Um, the Kuomintang no longer, I mean, they see themselves as the Taiwan Kuomintang. They don't, of course, they don't see themselves as, as having any legitimate claim over the bigger part. And they're, they're now no longer supportive of the 92 consensus. So they, you know, the, the Kuomintang and the DPP's position are, quite close, which is that we, we identify ourselves as Taiwanese, not Chinese, you know, that, and that, and that, that we don't, uh, we don't want to have the Chiang Kai-shek memorial in the center of Taipei anymore. Mm -hmm. And even Sun Yat-sen, uh, you know, is now being questioned. They want an indigenous um, Taiwan using the local Chinese dialect and the interpretation of history, which is that Taiwan has never been under the sovereignty of the mainland. And, you know, it, it was a before the colonization of Taiwan by the Japanese in 1890, its connections to China were tenuous at best, and that it's always been an independent place. Well, I mean, that, I'm not endorsing that interpretation of history. It's just that, you know, if you read the history books of the one and you read the history books of the other, they're talking about the same island, but, uh, you know, their interpretation of what happened in the past is by no means compatible. So if I could just, uh, you know, endorse what, uh, what Senator McFedrin said, is, you know, if our relations with China are so bad, um, you know, with really no hope of, of any kind of resolution, uh, you know, no hope that China will, in fact, 
become a responsible stakeholder in global affairs or, um, you know, uh, support the, the, the rules and intention of multilateral agencies like the UN or the WTO and so on, then why is it that we basically um, sacrifice uh, Taiwan to appease the very strongly held emotional nationalism that the mainland has inculcated in the people in China through the socialization and education process and propaganda. In other words, you know, shouldn't we be saying, well, um, we don't have any stake in this. Uh, Taiwan is Taiwan, China is China, and, and we will simply engage in, in relations with Taiwan based on what's in the mutual interest of both states. And there's really no reason why we shouldn't, um, you know, be sending senior officials to Taiwan if that is appropriate, or, or uh, even, you know, referring to the representative of Taiwan in Canada as an ambassador, or you know, this kind of thing. Uh, that, you know, that would be uh, probably a good, a good Canadian approach, keeping consistent with our values, in the context of a reevaluation of where we stand vis-a-vis -vis China, which is not as a you know, a strategic partner, but more of a strategic competitor in global affairs. So I, I, I think this would be the direction that we're moving and uh, it'll make China mad as hops. But I think that, that, I don't think that it would make our relations worse. In fact, I believe that if we show some backbone to China um, and cease to consistently appease China with regard to things like hostage diplomacy or spurious imposition of, of non-tariff barriers to Canadian agricultural exports designed to economically coerce our government not to, you know, say crack down on Chinese influence operations in Canada or espionage or, you know, criticize China's malign behavior in, in other parts of the world, that we might gain more respect of the regime and, and could then do what you know, Jim is talking about, which is sit down and try and come up with some arbitration. You know, the 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 reason that that we're completely dependent on the United States for resolution of the Michael Kovrick and Michael Saver hostage diplomacy is because we have no skin in the game because we made no response whatsoever to um, that outrage beyond you know what's referred to as quiet diplomacy, where we hope that if China you know, if we talk to China enough that they will have goodwill and a sense of justice and release those two men. Well, 850 days later, you know, I think we have to, 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 to think that that really uh, has not worked out as we'd hope. I mean, I wouldn't, I certainly wouldn't blame the government of Canada for the horrors that Mr. Kovrick and Mr. Favor are enduring. It's clearly, you know, on the heads of the Chinese, but in terms of what's the best way for Canada to move forward as a middle power in the world and, re and defend our interests and multilateralism, uh, I think vis-a-vis -vis China, we have to be rethinking how we go about it. And, and maybe, you know, hopefully, if we can find enough common ground with the Biden administration and like-minded par powers in Europe, Scandinavia, and Asia, that, um, that we can, you know, bring China around to the idea that we ought to be as Jim wants uh, engaging in in forms of arbitration and reconciliation to try and make it all work for us in the interests of global peace and and prosperity. And imagine if China actually became a responsible stakeholder in the world, the economic opportunities for both sides would be huge. But right now we can't engage with them economically very much because we don't trust them because they impose taxes, non-tariff barriers and purloin intellectual property and proprietary manufacturing processes. So, you know, that they, they, it's, if, if, they, if they played by the rules of the game, I think we definitely want to get into that game and everybody would benefit, in particular China. So... You know, that's more or less how I take it. I, I don't I'd disagree like, with Mary Lowe at all. I'd like to jump in just with one more sentence, and that is on top of the, we'll give you the large... Four, I'll give you three or four sentences, Mary Lou. Oh, you thank want. you. <laughs> thank you so much. Um, but, but I really want, um, based on my own experience from the period of time that I worked inside the UN system based in Geneva and what I've seen as a parliamentarian, and that is the small ways and the big ways that Canadians can be recognizing Taiwan, a, a range of ways. Charles has spoken primarily to the big 
um, messaging that happens government to government. But the ways in which China blocks Taiwan are minute in detail as well as massive in detail. And I'll give you one example. And that is any time that there's a, a Taiwan is involved in um, helping with, for example, just panel, just a panel at the UN. In, in my time working there, we were organizing a panel on health and working with the Taiwanese office. I mean, look at how what Taiwan has done around COVID, for example. That's not that's not a one-off. This is this is a country that and look what they did with SARS. I mean, it, it has an excellent track record in terms of health practices for a population. And um, the Taiwanese person who was going to be speaking on this panel, a UN-sponsored panel, was an expert. And China called around, made all kinds of threats by phone, and that person was disinvited. Now that happens constantly. It happens in Ottawa as well. The other aspect of this is the economic presence of Canada. Again, I wanna to speak to small details. There are small rural communities in Manitoba where their committee or their council on local economic development is substantially funded by China. Local people, rely their salary to work on local issues are being funded by China. And mm. that's not something that's well appreciated. So I think that at many levels, and I guess the last thing I would say is I, I think there's an unfortunate number of former high level politicians in Canada um, who have actually made considerable amounts of money being paid by China. Mm. To, to go to China, to speak for China. And these are the kinds of potential conflicts of interest that I, I hope we're paying attention to. I'd be interested in hearing from Peter Russell on this. Peter, I was interested enough in your book on sovereignty that I, uh, I bought a copy while you were talking about it. And <laughs> unfortunately, I'm unable to search it uh, uh, to see if the word Taiwan appears in it. So I'm probably actually gonna have to read it. Um, but in the meantime, um, your, your concluding chapter addresses the limitations of UN institutions posed by concepts of sovereignty. Um, and Taiwan would seem to be the ultimate test of some of these things, a, a, a very competing claim to sovereignty with, with real military repercussions. And uh, I don't know how the UN gets around this. It's one question as to whether the United States decides to switch to recognizing Taiwan and, and another whether Canada does and, and other Western countries. Um, but is the, is the UN capable of having both China and Taiwan uh, in its general assembly and other institutions? For those who didn't buy the book online, uh, in the very first chapter to set out my uh, analytical scheme on sovereignty, I have a matrix comparing France and Taiwan with respect to sovereignty. Uh, one, because it seems so unproblematic, uh, a claim, although I point out some problems with their claim, uh, and, uh, and Taiwan. Um, so, and what that uh, matrix uh, presents is uh, a four-dimensional analysis of the claim to sovereignty. Sovereignty is not an it, it's not a law, it's a claim. Some, just to back up, uh, it's a claim to the individual, thing, the, the Me Too women's movement claims sovereignty over their bodies. Uh, what it means is uh, claiming to be the only legitimate authority of what goes on within the borders of your body or your country to the people of your country and the land within it. Uh, so uh, that's, the, that's the basic claim. Uh, and uh, in the case of uh, 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 both France and Taiwan, uh, there are four dimensions are, first of all, the effectiveness of a claim. Um, Taiwan, 
is uh, an example where it hasn't been effective uh, in making the claim. The effectiveness depends on how much of the sort of powers in the world accept the claim. Uh, the other dimension is the legitimacy of the claim. And the legitimacy, legitimacy claim of the claim depends on internal acceptance of it, uh, the consent of uh, most of the people, and the legitimacy of the outside world uh, depends on international ethics. Uh, kind of thing that Jim Rennie's interested in is it, a, is it a legitimate? Have they just had it imposed on them? So in the case of Taiwan, I suggest its internal legitimacy is probably pretty sound, although we haven't heard from the Kuomintang, the, the opposition, whether they would support uh, Taiwan's claim to sovereignty or whether it would give them, it would be distressful for them, whether they're really willing to move to a two China. Uh, we don't, we don't, I didn't know when I wrote my book and finished it last November where they stood on that question of internal legitimacy. I think the outside world the legitimacy is, would be very high uh, of, for Taiwan. So that, that's the kind of uh, analysis I do. So I would think at the UN there would be a, a very good chance uh, of the General Assembly uh, recognizing Taiwan as a member of the United Nations uh, but uh, Jim Rennie, you might uh, uh, help me out here. I don't know whether China, as a permanent member of the Security Council, uh, can veto that. Um, I, just a, a point of UN law. <laughs> I'm not. Uh, I don't know off the top of my head. I, I think you would be. I'm getting online to see if I can find the answer. <laughs> UN, and I'm not sure what in the UN removed this, the, the, the seat on the Security Council initially belonged to the Republic of China in Taipei. And I think it was in the late 1970s that the UN decided to hand that seat on the Security Council to People's Republic of China in Beijing. And I, I don't know what, what uh, authority of the UN did that. Was it a General Assembly vote? Was it, uh, I don't know. It was a resolution of the General Assembly in 1971. I mean, you know, practically speaking, um, China is able to mobilize a large number of UN members to oppose anything that China doesn't like. I mean, you know, they. Yeah. Right, I, I was uh, talking to Bob Ray on Meta's program uh, last time, and, you know, he was talking about, I think we were up to 39 countries that agreed with Canada that that uh, China's activities against the Uyghurs constitute uh, genocide, but China was able to mobilize a larger number of countries that said that um, China's policies uh, do, do not constitute genocide. And in fact, situation in, in those areas is uh, wonderful. Um, so, you know, from that point of view, the, the actual getting a vote, but, but of course, as we all know, you know, there's ample precedent for countries that have uh, competing claims over territory to have seats in the UN, you know, North Korea, South Korea, Yemen, um, East and West Germany. I mean, these have all been in, in the UN and North Korea and South Korea are still in the UN, uh, despite the fact that, that either side thinks that they should be in charge of all of it. So, you know, I think in terms of precedent, the idea that Taiwan could have a seat on the UN while China retained its, its uh, membership in the P5 is not inconceivable good but, but but i mean how it comes about is almost unthinkable i think the, the the risk implicit in what charles is saying is that um if the united states goes ahead quickly and decides to recognize taiwan with only a handful of countries supporting it and nowhere close to a majority on the un um it's yeah. going to look like a u.s china thing to both parties and runs a much bigger risk of, uh, of provoking a military confrontation. It would seem to me that it's worth being patient on this and, and building up a larger international alliance, ideally one that 
includes some unlikely countries that have been elbow twisted into this uh, sort of thing. Is it, is it worth waiting until we can, until it can look like the international community supporting this? I think, Doug, that, you know, the, the problem and, and the cause for a future Cold War is that, you know, the countries on our side who support an international rules-based order are in the minority. The countries that support China's perspective on international institutions are, are um, much greater. And so, you know, unless there are changes in China where, whereby the people demand that the Chinese regime become one respectful of the rights of citizenship and support the idea of independent rule of law and, and, uh, and the idea of China being a, an important member in the global community, but not desiring global domination, you know, the China's current, current legitimacy of the regime is based on this mythology that the U.S. is a, is a power in decline and that China will rise up to assume supreme authority over all global affairs and restructure the global economy through the Belt and Road Initiative to, to put China at the center and the rest of us subordinate. I mean, this, this is the legitimizing myth. It's not actually, you know, factually based. I don't think we can count out the U.S., you know, within the next five or 10 years or something, or, and I don't think the Belt and Road will actually work because it, it lacks economic feasibility. But in any event, that's the legitimating myth. So unless you have a new government in China that doesn't adopt this idea that China was humiliated in the past, that China historically has been the dominant civilization on the planet to which all other nations should be subordinate and pay tribute, but but a regime that has a more modern democratic perspective on on China's domestic and international affairs, I don't think we're going to get anywhere. You know, so waiting, what we're really waiting for is either China triumphs or or China becomes you know realized our ambitions. But you know, Peter and and I were involved for many years in a project to promote democracy in China, yes. along with some of, you know, wonderful people, Alan Cairns and Ramsey Cook and uh, uh, Stefan Dion. Stefan Dion was, was excellent. Um, you know, and we, we put our hole into it on the assumption, my naive assumption that if, if the Chinese, if the Chinese elite understood how things work in Canada, that they would want that you know, that they would uh, would be sort of like the old song, to, to know her is to love her. So if we explained enough about Canada, the Chinese government would say, yes, that's a, you know, a good way for us to go. Well, you know, a billion, uh, our project didn't cost a billion dollars, but the total seed, uh, as I say, investment in this was over a billion. And frankly, it's gone completely to dust. You know, there is no, uh, I don't think there's a single thing that we can look at that all those hundreds of hours that Peter and I put into this that have actually borne some fruit or hold some potential in the future to, to um, you know, do some good for the world. So I'd like to add an observation at this point, and that is, again, to make the point about China's strategy, which is turning out to be highly successful, of using economic investment a very, very different model from what we typically have been using as democratic countries of the kind of project that you're talking about, Charles, and I, I reference it with great respect for the good faith and high level of expertise that Canadians contributed year after year after year to that. But meanwhile, um, for any of you pre-COVID who were visiting countries in Africa, for example, China's presence is an economic uh, sledgehammer if it needs, if it decides to use that sledgehammer because you, you land in airports that are built by China, that are run by China, where the, the name of the airport in a, ra a range of African countries is in Chinese. Um, you get situations where in order to continue the economic investments on which the African country has become dependent, highly dependent, then there are trade-offs like, well, now you have to promise to teach Chinese starting in grade one in your school system. And so that kind of takeover, that kind of, of um, bullying is economic and it's not out of their international aid envelope because it's not money being given, it's investment. And right. it, has, it has created 
massive leverage at every level on health, on education, you name it. Um, and it's, I mean, it's impressive. It's, it's terrifying, but it's impressive. I guess the only thing I'd urge as I listen to these excellent discussions is two things. Number one, patience, as Mr. Saunders was saying, patience in spite of everything. And that perhaps Canada has a key role to play here. As we've heard Senator McFedrin discuss, there's all these huge continuum of, of, of things that are besides just recognition of an ambassador that could be done and that are probably worth doing. No, I agree with uh, with the senator. And, and in fact, what you're talking about is the focus of all of my consulting work for governments around the world, including Canada. I, I just completed a major report for the Department of National Defense, which actually you know goes into this non-conventional um, defense doctrine. Um, uh, and uh, and I, I'm I'm also completing a major study on on Canadians who are beholden to the Chinese regime. You know, people who mm. treated um, China kindly when they were in positions of public trust, who were then um, generously rewarded after retirement, mm. and and then continued to promote the the interests of a foreign state um, in Canada through their statements. So mm. anyway, that. That study is, um, I don't know if they'll ever see the light of day, frankly, because <laughs> of the, um, you know, the risk of, of lawfare. I've already, I've already had this experience of, of mm -hmm. uh, for an article that I wrote in the Globe and Mail a few years ago called The Murky World of Chinese Influence, where, um, you know, where uh, a Ontario cabinet minister, uh, Michael Chan, um, sued Globe and Mail Inc., the publisher of Globe and Mail, the editor of the Globe and Mail, uh, reporter Craig Offman and me. Um, uh, but the, the process was such that it's never actually come to court. And so while a statement of claim was hmm. issued by Mr. Chen's lawyers um, containing a number of things about me, which are complete and utterly non-factual, um, we've never had any opportunity to to bring Mr. Chan to court and question him about these things. And in fact, you know, there was nothing in my article for the Globe, which frankly would be by any means libelous. It had been reviewed by the Globe and Mail's libel lawyers the night before. And, you know, so mm -hmm. you do have this kind of problem of how to expose but Charles, how come? this activity. Well, sorry, why, why hasn't it gone to court? I mean, this is a, an interesting thing that you can, you can get into a quagmire where you can't even resolve a dispute of that kind. As I just said, I have enormous amount of information developed by my research team at the at the European Value Center for Security Policy with some supplementary assistance with artificial intelligence by the Double Think Lab in Taiwan that that uses, you know, strong social scientific methodology to show who is um, acting under the influence of a foreign state in our country, but mm -hmm. I'm I'm not you know I'm not going to be releasing that the list of names and the you know and the basis for this because of because of the fear of of um, getting into um, you know legal trouble not not based on the fact that one is in fact libeling anybody but that people will will respond because their reputations are being are being uh, questioned. I, I get it, but I don't what I don't understand is how they manage I, I assume that you really want it to go to court so you yes. can settle the matter. But you but you can't get it to go to court? Why? My my legal expenses were covered by the Council of Ontario Universities as I was a university professor at that time. And the article had been submitted through Brock University's media department, um, and the Globe and Mail had their own lawyers. But uh, what what happened is that over time, more and more um, documents and so on were were presented, and I think that my lawyers and Mr. Chan's lawyers uh, were probably um, quite, you know, generating a lot of billable hours. But it was never, you know, they never set a date it looks to me like the idea is to cause the maximum economic harm to the Globe and Mail by, you know, their, their libel lawyer insurance going up because so much has had to be dispersed to 
address the the concerns of Mr. Chan's lawyers. What I wonder is, is this a single instance of something that is more generally uh, a problem? It, this sounds like a real threat to democracy. If you have this on a major scale, so that you can't have a public discussion about a, an issue such as foreign influence in, in can, Canadian affairs, you can't have a discussion because people are afraid of uh, the cost of running a lawsuit or something of that mm -hmm. kind. If this happens a lot, that that discourse is inhibited, uh, this would be scary to me. And 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 uh, if your case is an unusual, rare thing, then okay, uh, so it happens once in a while. But if this happens enough to make a difference in terms of public discussions of issues, that's where I would say, hey, this is fighting matter. Yes, and it, uh, is, it is happening it happens, a lot. It happens a lot. It yeah. happens a lot. And it's yeah. called libel chill. And it's a very yeah. specific yeah. strategy to silence. Mm -hmm. And it um, has been born primarily by advocates in environmental issues, um, especially those who question extraction industries. Um, but I, I'm part of the, uh, the group that uh, Charles is a member of now, having lived through a six-year lawsuit of libel chill um, for a piece that, that I wrote uh, in the Globe and Mail. It's now more than 20 years ago, but this is, this is far more common than people realize. And a number of jurisdictions, including Ontario, not the current government, but including Ontario, made changes to the libel law to respond to the fact that very often there are statements of fact that are made by advocates, by experts in the public interest that are, are then, um, then trigger this use of the legal system to silence. And of course, one of the advantages of drawing out the case as Charles has described is it when you have it actively before the courts, the media can't look into it and can't report on it um, because it is in the courts. And so this is a, an extension of the silencing. It's a tactic. Well, we have here a Globe and Mail man, and I see, that, uh, I see him being very <coughs> quiet here. Uh, and what kind of justification can you give, Doug, for what your outfit is being accused of? I can't speak to that individual case because it is currently before the courts and it involves uh, an employer of mine. Uh, but I will say in general, this is quite uh, a commonplace practice for civil cases over libel to drag out for years. And in some cases, and I'm not saying this is the case in this particular instance, but in some cases for the plaintiff to deliberately use this process and in fact to use a libel suit to prevent that issue from being written about for a number of years. And I think you'll find many, many journalists in Canada have their names on the docket from, from, uh, in, involving various civil claims uh, that probably are, have been launched in order to keep that issue out of the press because the, the journalist and the organization are going to avoid writing about it during the period when it's still before the courts. They don't have to, but they do. The piece that came out in 2015 entitled The Murky World of Chinese Influence, that's my piece commenting on the reporting by Craig Offman um, at the behest of, of the Globe Mail uh, editorial people. And, you know, since then, as you're probably aware, I've published tens, many, many, many pieces. And, you know, I, uh, 15 or 15 a year, probably in the Globe Mail alone. So, What's that? Five times fifteen. I've done seventy-five, say, op-ed pieces in the Globe and Mail since that came out. So it doesn't seem to have chilled the Globe and Mail or other no. And I should say that papers about I, the Burton I, product. I can say I can safely say that 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 case has not chilled anything. But you, it, it is reasonable to ask when libel cases drag on for years and years whether the plaintiff is attempting something like that. Yeah, that's all. I mean, that's all I know. <laughs> I would have loved to have a more of a conversation about sovereignty because in general, you know, I'm thinking some of the solutions that I see to global issues involve um, the development of a, just sort of a transnational political entity that is, if not world federalist, at least um, global in perspective. 
such as, for example, a, a parliament, um, parliamentary assembly at the UN, which would be elected by the populace and not accountable specifically to nation states. So that's a whole different conversation that I'd like to have with, with Peter one of these times. Jim, I, uh, I really endorse your moves through uh, UN sponsored mediation and arbitration. Um, before I say goodbye, I want to just also indicate uh, that um, the last time I worked with Peter Russell on an issue was on changing the electoral system in Canada to a form of proportional representation. Mm -hmm. And while, while we failed on that, um, one of the things that I learned from Peter was that changes can be constitutional in impact, even if they aren't necessarily an amendment to a constitution. This is a bit of a shout out to you, Peter. Okay. And uh, extend the constitutional right to vote to uh, the age of 16. Mm -hmm. and, um, and similar to the discussion around proportional representation when Peter pointed out over and over again that it had constitutional impact, um, I'm hoping that we will be successful at least in the period of time I have left as a Senator to lower the federal voting age to 16. Well, Thank you. Good. I just wanted to say in, the, in my book as I look towards the Jim, the need for some uh, enforcement of international norms. I do look to a world authority. Uh, and I, in my mind, it could only be structured in a federal way, in a very decentralized federal way, with almost all the normal functions of government staying with the nation states of the world. Uh, but a central government having uh, powers to tax uh, and powers to raise armed force and use armed force that are, cannot be taken away by the member states. Sounds and good. Of course, right. <laughs> and of course, uh, so it has to be very democratic in its nature. And there I draw on Bruno Morowitz, who taught me philosophy in the 1950s at Trinity College, and his idea of, now uh, wait for the word, temporalism, representing people by the day they were born, by their birth date, um, not by where they live. Not I love that. Right. <laughs> and so, and we, we has a solution for a leap year. So Charles, what day were you born? Uh, I, I was born on March the twenty fourth. So do I get do I get to have uh, Senator McFedrin um, representing me? In <laughs> March twenty is not in your riding, uh, so you have vigorous politics. But they they couldn't be based on what's good for my place and not so hot yeah. for your place. Yeah. Uh, temporalism would force you uh, to uh, think of issues and solutions to them that all humanity and the planet have an interest in. Okay, it's been fun. Thanks so much, everybody. This has been Thank a great you. Take care. Bye. Bye.